The World Economic Forum in 2015 highlights water crises among the biggest threats to global economic and social development. The trends that they point out in this report are alarming. One of the statistics is that one-third of the global population is expected to be living in extreme water scarcity by 2030 if things don't change. Now, admittedly, Seattle is a little difficult of a place to highlight the, the dramatic global crisis that there is. But what happens is the water crisis plays out different in every place around the world. Last week, I was in California where a historic drought is playing out in the news and the extreme policy reactions that are coming out of the government. But for most people that are suffering the global water crisis, their water scarcity is not newsworthy, it's just a way of life. This is a, a shot from last month in a small community in central El Salvador, a coffee growing area, where these two girls, they walk 10 minutes to fetch water from a water source and bring it home. This is their reality. They do this multiple times a day. And this task is one reason that they're not in school on a Tuesday morning. There are some characteristics about the global water crisis that are common in many places. Basically, it's an issue of supply and demand. On the demand side, demand for water has increased exponentially over the last several decades in response to population growth and economic development. On the supply side, water resources are being, being degraded and contaminated. And agriculture plays a core piece in this picture. On the demand side, agriculture demands 70 to 80 percent of the water that we use worldwide. And on the supply side, poor agricultural practices are degrading water resources. And this is where coffee comes in. This is taken from a news article in Nicaragua in January 2013 where 7,000 families in the city of Matagalpa, Nicaragua, were without potable water for two weeks due to a spill from a coffee mill. This is not an isolated event. In fact, what Matagalpa has a lot of water resources flowing in rivers around and through the city. But the water is so contaminated that the city is not able to use it for its drinking water supply and chose instead to pump water 20 kilometers away, uphill into the city, at a great cost. This is the role for, for uh, specialty coffee. This stream is the water source for 3,500 people living in Comasagua, El Salvador. The watershed that provides this drinking water also provides specialty coffee that we drink around the world. So in a very real way, we are all connected to this watershed. We all drink downstream. Getting a perspective of the scale of this, we're working with CATIE, a research institution based in Costa Rica, on a GIS study to evaluate the impacts of coffee on drinking water supplies in Central America. GIS is looking at three levels. Known drinking water sources that have been geo-referenced in the region, known coffee growing areas, and then population data from the census in each country. Using very conservative assumptions, there are at least 9 million people in Central America who rely on the coffee lands for their water supply. If you're skeptical about that number, think about some of the, the cities that you know of. San Jose, Costa Rica, Guatemala City, San Salvador, and many others. And it's not a mistake or a coincidence that these cities emerged and grew in coffee-growing areas because coffee was the predominant part of the economy in these countries a century ago. So to understand the role that coffee production plays in people's um, water supply, I want to talk a little bit about green water, blue water, and, their, and, and the way that this uh, leads to coffee uh, water production. So when rain falls over a landscape, it does one of a few things. A portion of the water is absorbed by trees or the soil surface and then it's either evaporated or transpired back into the atmosphere. The water that's transpired contributes to vegetative production, and that's why it's called green water. In the tropics, 90 to 99% of rainfall 
is converted into green water, remains in the green water cycle. Coffee, as virtually all coffee is, is rain-fed, is a green water crop. Now, another portion of water that falls over a landscape runs over the land surface or infiltrates into the groundwater and becomes blue water. This is the water that we use for domestic use, for industry, for irrigation, for recreation. This is normally the water that we count, that we measure. Now, a healthy watershed does a fantastic job at managing these green water and blue water cycles. A healthy watershed absorbs, captures, absorbs, and slowly releases water year-round through streams, springs, and recharges aquifers. An unhealthy watershed loses this capacity to manage the green water and blue water cycles. So imagine a deforested watershed in a heavy storm event where virtually all of the water runs off, causing soil erosion, landslides, floods, and fails to recharge the aquifers. So here's the big take-home message here. There is no agricultural system more effective than shade-grown coffee for managing the water cycle. And this is the role that co where, where specialty coffee can play. So what are the alternatives to agriculture, to coffee in some of these areas. These two farmers have just cut all the vegetation on the land on their farm, burned it, and are planting maize and beans to grow food on their land. On the other side of the fence is shade-grown coffee. And all of this is happening within the buffer zone of a protected area that provides drinking water to tens of thousands of people living around this area. El Salvador stands out as a cautionary tale here. At its peak, El Salvador was producing 2.5 million sacks of coffee per year. In this past year, it produced about 800,000. Now, this is reflective of, obviously, coffee rust's impact on productivity. But more alarmingly, this is a result of a permanent transition away from coffee into less uh, uh, less sustainable and more destructive agricultural practices. El Salvador needs coffee for its water resources. So what's to be done? The first lesson is manage soil to manage water. Good soil management is fundamental to good plant productivity for building resilient coffee agroforestry systems, resilience to disease and drought. And good soil management is also great for water recharge. Right now, we are collecting data on hundreds of farms in Central America to understand the role of soil management on water. What we're learning, what we're seeing in these months, which are the driest months of the year, is that well-managed uh, farms where we're promoting soil restoration, there's a 10 to 20% increase in soil moisture. Now, the implications for water recharge are big, and we're me measuring those flows also to understand how those flows are increasing. So one recommendation is that if you're supporting farmers, focus on soil management. Over the past couple of years, we've been looking at uh, certification standards for coffee to understand how they might be strengthened to improve the way that water is protected and restored in the coffee lands. What we saw is one of the gaps is that farms and mills, even the, the, those that are certified, double certified, triple certified, some of those can be contaminating drinking water supplies. So what we've been recommending is that the certifications be upgraded to focus specifically on drinking water. And then as part of that, we're suggesting a very simple water impact assessment tool that basically just asks the question, is there a risk to a water source? And if the answer is yes, detail each of the threats and then ask the farmers or the millers to design a mitigation activity for each of those threats. This morning, Daniele talked about you measure what you manage. He, he was talking about indicators that look at practices versus performance indicators. And one of the critiques of the standards, of coffee certification standards, is that they're too much focused on best management practices and there's not enough focus on the actual impacts of the application of those standards. I have found in the conversations with the coffee certification organizations that they've been the most analytical and the most reflective about how to improve the model to improve the downstream or the impacts of standards. 
Rainforest Alliance shared with me a study in Colombia by Seni Cafe that looked at 27 farms that were certified, Rainforest Alliance certified, and 27 farms that weren't, and measured the downstream water flows and the downstream water quality. And the good news is that in, those, in the farms that were managed, uh, that, that are certified by, by Rainforest Alliance, water quality and water flows improved. So the recommendation is let's, let's, let's measure water quality and water flows downstream of the areas where we source coffee. The next one is use less water to mill coffee, and this has got to be obvious to everybody in the room and here in symposium and expo. This is a big focus by a lot of people. The technologies and the engineering to reduce how much water is used in coffee mills is well known and proven. However, only 10 to 15 percent of the mills around the world actually use that technology or the engineering to reduce how much water is being used in the mills. We're working with ACEDES, a consultancy based in Costa Rica, to look at what are the few changes in a coffee mill that would have the most impact to reduce the amount of water used in a mill and to reduce um, water contamination coming out of the mills. Now, um, the study is very, it, it's great, and, and we will be um, sharing and publishing that. But I think one of the most interesting things coming out of it is the take-home message that the first thing, if you have to make a choice on, where, on how much you can invest in a mill, the, the place to begin is on reducing water quality. A lot of people are investing in water treatment before they actually deal with the water volume. If you, if you deal first with water volume, then you reduce the amount of water that you have to treat and reduce the cost of treatment. Now, most mills have a hard time affording the investments that are needed to upgrade their mills. So one recommendation for the coffee, the specialty coffee industry, is to work with others, um, rainforest, oots, uh, root capital, others who are working with mill to upgrade the, these and access the financing that's required to be able to upgrade these mills. The next recommendation is to know the source. A couple of years ago, we had a, a conversation with Equal Exchange about their Eight Rivers project, which is an initiative to buy or source coffee from the buffer zones of UNESCO biosphere reserves around the world. What I found inspiring by this was the idea that a coffee company is building a relationship with a landscape and the people that live there and explicitly investing in building awareness about the natural resources in that area and building local capacity to manage those resources better. We're applying a similar approach in the Blue Harvest Program in Central America, supported by Keurig, where we've selected seven zones within, the, within in Central America, coffee-producing areas, that are the water sources for small towns and cities. And I think this could be a model where other companies could be taking the same thing, embracing, committing to a place, and, and to uh, managing the water resources in that, in, in that place. There's fantastic partnerships within the specialty coffee industry. One interesting one that I want to highlight here is Tom's Coffee partnership with Water for People. Now, the model is that for a, a portion of the proceeds from every bag of coffee that's sold by Tom's, they provide funds to Water for People to improve access to water in areas where, where Tom sources its coffee. The, the interesting part about this model is the idea that Tom's is partnering with Water for People, a very strong, good, capable NGO at, at dealing with water. There are other examples of this. We have Starbucks, SND, uh, partnering with Conservation International to, um, to develop their, their uh, environmental standards in the places where they work. Uh, Smuckers is supporting uh, TechnoServe in Central America to promote best management practices. And there's a lot of, lot of other, many people in this room are part of these partnerships where the goal is to improve the livelihoods and the environment and the places where, where they're sourcing coffee. The recommendation here is that those partners, that, that new partnerships focus particularly on the idea of protecting and managing water resources. And that how important it is to partner with uh, organizations, companies, um, communities, municipalities, people with the expertise to be able to carry this work out. And the final point, is to recognize when it comes to water resources management, it's not a one-off. It's not a project. It's a commitment for the long term. 
And the people who are responsible for managing their water resources and the ones who benefit or are negatively impacted are the people that live there. So there's a critical role that in the, in the initiatives that we partner on in the coffee lands that we build the capacity of local people for the long term to manage their water resources. Thank you very much. Thank you.